Ladies and gentlemen, Robbie Davidson. It was yeah. amazing, yeah. Robbie's been uh, one of the, uh, there's been a, a lot, but Robbie's the one that's been uh, the most helpful with, you know, what goes on behind the scenes? How do we get this thing going? What, what do I need to do first? And uh, of course, the first thing he said is, you need to find a facility. So this is what we ended up with. So thank you guys for that. So Robbie's um, books and DVDs um, in, in the back up there. I want to make sure you stop by there and have a look at his stuff. Um, he's going to be talking about scientism today. So that's uh, a lot of the stuff that he's got back there. but. You know, with, with all the latest stuff that's going on with YouTube and, uh, you know, Facebook and, and all these different groups that are, are starting to uh, devalue uh, the, the work that all these guys are, and girls are doing out here, um, if it was such a, you know, a, a farce, why would they go through so much hassle to do all that stuff? Exactly. It's a, it's a great question because if this is just so silly and ridiculous and the topics we're going to be talking about, you know, most people are looking at it like, wait a minute, mainstream science has already established these facts. This is crazy talk. But if it's just crazy talk, why is it so dangerous? Why are they moving in censorship measures to the extremes that they have? You know, with YouTube, social media giants, there's things that, you know, I've even been in discussion with YouTube, and they're moving that way because they're getting pressure. And a lot of people are saying, look, you've got to do something here. And that only, that only tells me that this is really resonating with a lot of people. A lot of people are waking up to the lies of scientism. Yeah. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Robbie's uh, Slido code for tomorrow's Q&A is going to be RD and the number two. So if you have any questions for him about any stuff that he's talking about, um, get those questions in and we'll, we'll get those covered under the, uh, the Q&A panel tomorrow. So uh, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, Robbie Davidson. Let's do it. All right, we're going to be talking about scientism. And this is something that, uh, you know, I didn't start off with at first. It was uh, early 2015 when I came to the topic of flat earth. And why I'm not afraid of media or people making fun of these topics is because I came across a video that was actually done in, I believe, 2007. This was well before anyone else that m most people know, Math Powerland or Eric Dubé or other people. This was a 2007 video that was making fun of it. Now, it was also making fun of the Bible. And I said, well, wait a minute, but this is what the Bible says, because I held to a literal interpretation of the Bible. But when I, start, when I started seeing these ideas of firmament and the way they were showing these illustrations and laughing at them, I said, wait a minute, I have to look into this some more. And this was in um, April of 2015. And while I did this investigation, it wasn't until August of 2015 when I came up with my channel Celebrate Truth. It was August, I believe, 19th, 2015. And I mean, this topic is resonating with a lot of people. Um, I just cr I crossed over 133,000 subscribers, almost 20 million views uh, in total on the channel. I mean, this, this topic is resonating with a lot of people. And one of the reasons was that when I started into this, I always had a passion for filmmaking, and I wanted to kind of incorporate that, especially with getting this truth out. And while I put out a few documentaries, getting into the alien deception, uh, getting into evolution, um, I did The Global Lie, I believe it was at the start of 2016. And uh, it featured uh, Rob Skiba and other people in there. And it was really showing the Bible matches up with what we're seeing and how science is diametrically opposed to it. It was a fascinating look at what was going on. What I wanted to show you is while I'm doing a presentation on scientism, this is exactly the documentary film that basically made me kind of the guy that, hey, that's the exposing scientism guy, right? I become like the scientism guy, even though I'm against it. So I wanted to uh, just play this to give you a good backdrop of what you were going to be looking into, but also how this really, really started to explode in uh, early 2016. We will restore science to its rightful place and wield technology's wonders. Ignorant just me simply means you don't know. But if you don't know and you have the power of influence over others, that's dangerous. If you don't know and you don't know that you don't know, that is particularly dangerous. There is no debate. Climate change is a fact. Now, as for getting your morals from the Bible, I very sincerely hope nobody does. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system. That Jesus is the Son of God who is redeeming humanity from original sin. The idea that we are born in sin 
and the only way we can be redeemed from sin is through the death of Jesus. I mean, that's a horrible idea. Megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So that's what you think of God? Yeah. How about the, the recent push to implement intelligent design in school curriculums? That's, it's very dangerous. bad. It's dangerous. very dangerous. Dangerous. I mean, this, you don't mess with, with, with the church. The church. You can see an agenda. Now, one thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the earth. There's no place to go. That was the trailer that I had re I released. Yes. And that was for the first scientism exposed. Thank you. Since then, it is, uh, the, the reaction is just remarkable to me. The amount of emails, the reviews. This is on the IMDb. And with over 340 reviews, it still maintains an 8.8, .8, which is fantastic for something, you know, at this level. And it was amazing to see what was happening with the comments, with the reviews. You know, there was something going on. And there was a pivotal shift that took place. I believe, you know, in 2014, 2015, I hold very, very strongly to the fact that this is not because we're smarter or people that woke up to this. This is supernatural. There was something supernatural that took place that woke people up massively right across all spectrums all different beliefs didn't matter male female age groups everyone is starting to question what pretty much mainstream science has had in place for a very long time since then i came out with scientism exposed to the sequel which was fantastic i was able to travel that was the first time meeting jared cressman uh, rob skiba other people that were involved in in the film uh pastor dean odell there was amazing journey of following me on that journey meeting these people that really you know these were the people that i had watched and i had looked up to and also learned a lot of what you know i'm presenting today it's amazing to me that a lot of the stuff that i'm touching on these are the people that really, you know, inspired me. And while, you know, I explained that I came across a video uh, that was making fun of Flat Earth and the Bible, you know, that was my introduction video. You know, after that, when I saw Flat Earth, I'm like, what is this Flat Earth? And of course, from there, I came to Flat Earth Clues, Mark Sargent. And it's amazing, you know, for Mark to be sitting here and just to see the tremendous, you know, profound impact that these videos early on were having and they really affect a lot of people incredibly this incredibly powerful so I released scientism exposed to the following year and then I just came out with my first book scientism exposed hiding the true creator of creation and that was about four months ago I wanted to read just really quickly the preface of it because I think it will help get into the content that we're going to be talking about and listen very carefully because it really sets the stage of what we're going to talk about and how important this topic truly is. We live in a world where the idea of truth has been altered and transformed in ways the human brain can barely comprehend anymore. Our values, our thoughts and our perception are molded in such a manner to benefit those powerful few who hide behind the curtain and puppeteers who push us and laugh at our disorientation. Their methods are vicious, always aiming at confusing us, because through confusion, they can rise above and rule us like flocks of sheep. Throughout the ages, various methods were used to brainwash and force the masses into submission, ranging from brute force to the propagation of brilliant lies. Right now, the world is confronted with an illogical phenomenon, scientism, a deadly religion that must be neither questioned nor debated. The scientist comes forth like a saint, and we must embrace his theories as pure truth regardless of the facts or hidden intentions. We're told that we need to believe we need not to question or wonder about the validity of the so-called scientific truths. This isn't science anymore, this is more like collective madness, where people are pushed aside and considering, sorry, and considered nothing but freaks of nature, an accident that might as well never happened. Over the years, the science proved its utility to mankind. The true fact-based science cured illnesses, helped us live a better life. But at the same time, a different branch evolved. Drugged by their importance and the attention they received, the members of this current system of thought replaced God with their own persona. They glorified their name and their agenda. While we just stood in the shadows and watched the spectacle. This new religion begins to call us heretics if we dare to oppose its theories. And soon, we'll go back to the dark ages, where we will not possess the courage to open our mouths and speak the truth. 
Even if it's right in front of our eyes, if analyzed in more detail, we can observe the war between the old and the new. The old being our, last, our long-lasting religions and the idea of divinity, and the new being the new religion and its intrusive ways. We see all over the media how science is glorified while religion is cast aside. We are encouraged from the earliest years of life through school to use scientism as the only way. Its aggressiveness is dubious, and one might think there might be a hidden agenda somewhere that someone or some group is trying to blind us to the truth. The light is all around, yet we fail to see it as if we're pushed to focus on a small dark dot. We're nothing in this universe, a speck of dust, appearing here by chance, a speck of dust that will fade away as quickly as it came into being, and in the end, we will be completely forgotten. It's time to pull back the veil of scientism, exposing many of the greatest deceptions in the world to hide the true creator of creation. So we're going to get into, you know, Matt Long opened up talking about apologetics and getting into the Bible and showing how much we can trust it and especially trusting the, the uh, historical account of Jesus. And I'm sitting up here today and for most of my life I laughed at the Bible. I thought it was ridiculous. Um, you know, I was actually pretty violent against uh, Christians in the sense that uh, I'd make fun of them. There are little stories about Noah's Ark or, you know, Genesis or laughing that they can't even get the creation story right. So it's amazing to me that now I'm exposing the things that I used to laugh at the fact that people would believe in such things as taking the Bible literal. But let's just see what the Bible has to say when it gets into um, the, uh, the Bible, what it says about scientism. We're going to get into 1 Timothy 6.20. And remember, this is really important because, again, we're always told warnings like, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. So we have an admonition right from the very beginning warning us of science falsely so called. Again, this is deadly, and we're going to get into what scientism is and how it differs from science. Because I'm up here today not against science, true science, the empirical method. It's wonderful. But scientism, however, is not just a religion, not just a belief system or a theory. It's deadly. It's a deception and it's an agenda. And there's many people's souls at stake. Many children from an early age are taught these things. Ancient government funded science agencies and authorities convinced mankind that stars were gods. If you look through the Bible, you get to the stargazers, the Gisellians, you get to the astrologers, the soothsayers. The Bible over and over talks about the stars and getting in there. And in times past, they were gods, they were revered. And we're going to see that right now, like Ecclesiastes says, that nothing new happens under the sun. Science is still revering the stars. They're showing that that's basically our origins. We're going to get into that. But before we do, let's get into what is science. Science is a method of inquiry and the knowledge acquired by that method. The scientific method involves hypothesizing, experimenting, observing, and drawing conclusions. Central to the method of science is that no theory is ever considered final. All theories are subject to scrutiny and re-examination. And if it's assumed that all will eventually be proven false by a more comprehensive theory. Now what's scientism? Scientism, on the other hand, is the belief that the methods of science are superior to all other methods of determining truth. Science believes things because they have been observed to be true. Scientism believes things because science says they are true. It is essentially a religion where its followers, scientists, worship science, its rituals, and its results. It might come to a surprise to most people that one of the most dangerous worldviews one can hold is scientism. Every single person is affected by scientism. They're told their origins, who they are, where they are, where they're going. All these things affect everyone, regardless of your belief. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. This is deadly because it affects every single person. Right? They're right. You're wrong. And this is exactly what we're going to be talking about here, is we're going to get into questioning them a lot more. That's for sure. Science is used to validate the deceptions. We see this over and over and over again. We're at question everything, and it's important that we do question things. 
But isn't it interesting how science always comes as the validator of all the deceptions we're going to be talking about over this weekend. I mean, the list is many. And I'm going to be dealing mainly with origins. I'm going to be dealing with the, the cosmology and other areas. But just for an example, let's just stop because I know other speakers are going to be speaking on these topics. But let's keep in mind that why do we know that vaccines don't cause autism? Science, right? Science has already proved that it's safe, it's fine, you know, get your vaccinations, no problem. I'm with science, climate change is no hoax, right? The scientists are coming and validating it, right? So while we're talking about flat earth and we're getting into all these things, science comes as the validator. And this is the most amazing deception because it's masqueraded inside truth. How do you argue with science? You know, we were taught from an early age, science is true. You know, whether you believe in it or not, Neil deGrasse Tyson would say, you can't argue with it. But over and over, for all the truth community that are into exposing the lies, we see science as the validator. And this is why it's so tough for the majority of the people, is because it's the scientists they're using to secure it in people's minds. That's why they don't want to believe you when you're bringing up, look into this. No, it's the scientists, right? 9-11, we already know that the official story is correct because what? Science, right? Professional skeptic ditches science when it comes to 9-11. So again, they're propping up science continually with everything, not just cosmology. And I'll be touching on that, but I wanted to bring this up because it's important because other speakers can be bringing other topics to the table. And it's science that validates it. That's why this is such an important topic. What if there's an agenda, agenda to deceive you, right? You can't question anything I say, I'm a scientist. We see this over and over and over again, right? What does the Bible say? It says, woe to those that are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Again, the Bible over and over warns. It warns about the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. It warns time and time again of the world's ways and where they're going to go in direct opposition to God. But we're going to question everything. And we're going to start to question things here and now. Let's get into this illustration. What do you see here? Evolution. evolution, right? This is exactly what's pushed in the in classrooms. But you know what's a better answer than even evolution, which is right, by the way? It's a cartoon. How is this science? This is a cartoon. The empirical method is about putting things through the ringer, right? This is a cartoon. This has, this has never been observed, ever. And yet this is the scientific, not just theory in their mind, this is proof. This is exactly what you believe in. This is exactly where we came from. This is a cartoon. Let's continue. What do we see here? Cartoons, right? They'll say like, oh, we're seeing the solar system or the Big Bang. This is a depiction of the Big Bang, right? No one's observed it. How does it fit in the scientific method? Theories is not facts. Theory is not truth. You can believe it all you want, but don't teach it, especially to the children, as truth. Yeah. What about this? What do you see here? More cartoons, right? CGI, all these type of things over and over and over again, right? You know, we even have like people pointing to this, like, look, look, we know it's a solar system. Really? How's that science? Right? We just keep going and going and going, right? Cartoons and glitter and, you know, people love their like pixie dust and stuff. And it's like they're finding all sorts of things in the universe. They got diamonds now. They got all sorts of things, planets with like gold auroras around it. I mean, it's just no end. I mean, if you start reading the articles, it gets more and more ridiculous on what they're claiming. But we come down to one that's probably one of the most ridiculous. And what was startling for me, you know, in 2015 was, what the heck? We've got all these satellites. How in the world do we not have a real photograph of the Earth? And even the fact that when they say there is a real photograph, you know, I'll give it to them that they're at least honest. You go to the NASA website and it says, CGI, renderings, composite. You know, it's like, thank you for being honest, but they're not photographs. And when they are photographs, there's all sorts of problems. But then, wait a minute, what's going on? And this is a great introduction when you're talking to people because it is very suspicious that with all those satellites, all the technology, we don't even have a picture of this. And this is what most people believe, including myself, most of you. I'd say all of us believed in this at one point. How did we not? But again, what does the Bible say when it comes to the true creation? Because this is exactly what we're going to talk about specifically, is how important it is and what was described not only in the Bible, but also with our senses and how science, I believe, Satan used scientism to basically railroad this as a Trojan horse. Let's read Romans 1, 18 to 22 to 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that's which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, 
even as eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever? Amen. And we're going to see more verses how this is fairy tales for adults when it comes to Big Bang cosmology. And it's simply saying that this is so foolish that they're not just opposed or they're going with another system. It's absolute foolishness. The fact that we're flying all around the universe and spinning and wobbling and you know going around the universe and it's just insane. The speeds, you talk about them and you're kind of like, what's going on? But understand that masquerading under science is a very clever way of you know going about things because you're going to see in this next clip, and this is like a high priest in the high council of Satanism in many, many of the orders. I think it was Jean Rallans, I believe. And he was coming on the record talking exactly what they were kind of communicated through spirit mediums on what the war would be. And there's other things I could talk about when it comes to how do you destroy the Bible without even picking up a sword, without even burning one book. And we're going to hear very clearly exactly the way they would do it with people's minds. The three things yeah. were, number one, that they did not want Satan, Satan did not want the human family to think that he or his angels existed. Right. The second point that you made had to do with taking control of people's minds. That's right. The third point was what? Was to destroy the Bible without burning it. Okay. See. And what was his strategy on that? On that, um, it was very interesting. Because after the great general council, it was decided that Satan would tutor Charles Darwin personally in setting up the uh, uh, the principles of his theories of evolution. He was tutored by Lucifer himself, Father Lucifer. And at that time, it was understood, Satan and his uh, spirit counselors understood that if a person was led to believe in the theory of evolution, it would in his life destroyed completely the, the, the uh, creation week of the Bible, the fall of man and plan of redemption. It would go away. Anyone that teaches a theory of evolution is considered to be a minister of a great religious system. And he said that every teacher of that theory is recognized by the spirit as a person of great value he is, and receives a very special unction from Satan himself giving great power to induce spiritual blindness, to convince and convert three capacities. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Romans 3 also explains that let God be true but every man a liar. We're going to see with evolution, obviously, the reason why that was put in place first is because Satan would want to attack the humanity, the value, the dignity. Before he even got into attacking the rest of creation, he would, he would start here. I'm talking about within the textbooks, within a direct assault as part of the limbs on the tree. And we're going to get into the root. And this is what most of this presentation is about. That while, yes, evolution is a lie, we're going to see that everything came from that magical Big Bang. 
Science and the Bible, do they contradict? Many people like to sit there and say, science and the Bible work together just wonderfully. But what they're saying most times is that scientism and the Bible work together. Wonderful. We can make it fit. We can't make it fit at all. And if you're really honest with the text, regardless where you stand on the Bible, if you read it for what it says, you can't. And you're going to find that not only people that really recognize the validity of the Bible and understanding exactly what it says, whether it says the earth doesn't move, or whether it talks about the sun being created, right? The earth being created before the sun, moon, and stars. You can't fit the heliocentric Big Bang universe in place. But let's not just listen to what I have to say or other people. Let's just see what even Neil deGrasse Tyson has to say because I think he recognizes the fact of the foolishness of trying to bring the two together, especially when it comes to scientism and the Bible. It was, oh my gosh, the, uh, the universe, there's gravity and it shapes the universe in this way. And then in 1929, Hubble discovers that the universe is expanding. Right. You take general relativity and the data that the universe is expanding and a clever physicist named George Lemaitre, okay. he was a Belgian physicist, looked at that and he said, wait a minute. If we're expanding and I have this new tool, theoretical tool to understand the whole universe, let's go back in time and ask, what would the universe have been yesterday compared with today? Right. It would have been smaller. Right. Let's go even smaller. Even smaller. Take it all the way back. So we go all the way back. We got to get down to a singular point. A singular point. Right. The beginning of things. Right. This person is a Belgian priest. Oh. An ordained priest. Mm, he must have drank some good beer. <laughs> Belgian beer? Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's beer in the church. I think it's all wine, okay? <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's the body and blood of Jesus, not the body and beer of Jesus. The, the rituals. That's right. It was the body and beer of Jesus. I'd have been hanging out. Here's to you, Padre. Right. <laughs> but so, go ahead. So, so people immediately said, oh my gosh, you have found proof of, of biblical creation. Oh, really? They said this to him. And he, a Belgian priest, came all back in their face and said, no. What? Because the Bible says the universe was created in six days. The Bible says Earth was created before the sun. There's a lot going on in Genesis that is scientifically untenable. Right. But now you want to take just a little bit that said God created it and say, oh, therefore it proves the Bible when nothing else that follows it right. has any anchoring in observational science. Right. He was... He was, he was um, smart enough to know that this, when I say smart enough, he was sensible enough to know that this should not be invoked as evidence for God creating Genesis as described in, in, in the Jewish Bible, in, right. the, in the Old Testament. Old Testament. So, because um, nothing else works there. Right. Okay, nothing. Nothing. Right. It, okay, Earth is in the middle of things. Everything revolves around the Earth. Earth is flat. The, 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 so, so this goes on and on and on. So he knew enough about the Bible and about science to not make that connection. Uh, we don't know what happened before the Big Bang, and we also don't know what dark matter is, nor dark energy. Right. If you, and I've said this before, and listen to my words very carefully. Mm -hmm. If you want, if your understanding of God right. flows through Places where science has yet to tread. Right. Because these are frontiers. Right. Before the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. If that's your concept of God. Right. Then the history of this exercise shows us that God would then be an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. Well, of course. I mean, that only makes sense because you're saying all these other things are provable. So, uh, and then you say, well, but what I don't know here, I just think that this is God doing this. But then our knowledge, our bubble our knowledge expands. Right. It encompasses that event. That event is no longer now attributed to God. That event is also now provable and knowable. Mm -hmm. And then that now it cannot be so Philosophers about. call this the God of the gaps. What's it called? Philosophers call it the God of the gaps. The God of the gaps. Right. So in other words, so just watch, just wherever just... your understanding fails you, you fill it in with God. Fill it in with God. Okay. 
So you can see absolutely, you know, there's a lot of mockery, there's laughing. Um, you know, if they, you know, if Neil deGrasse Tyson was to like attack the Quran or Muhammad, he'd probably be lynched the next day. Uh, it seems like the only political thing that you can actually attack is the Bible or Christianity. That's a whole other talk for another time. But what I will say is when it gets into the Bible, this is completely opposite. The Bible and the Big Bang are completely opposite in every single way, right? We've got the earth before the sun and the stars. They say the stars and the sun before the earth, right? Earth covered in water initially. Earth is a molten blob initially, right? We got the whole iron core. Oceans are first, then dry land. What does science say? Dry land, then the oceans. Life first created on the land, which the Bible says. What does evolution teach? We came out of the sea. This is a direct, like everything. I mean, if people want to sit there and say, okay, they're bringing up a couple of things, but can you see that every single thing of the Bible, they're not content without destroying every single one. Land animals created after the birds. What does mainstream science say? Land animals existed before birds. Whales before land animals. Land animals before whales. Actually, funny story is if you actually look into evolution, how they come up with whales, because it's a mammal, they got a big problem. This is the actual official story. A cow eventually became a whale. Stop and think about that. Have you ever seen a cow swim? How many cows drown? And think of the whole idea of swimming, trying to swim while drowning, and then mating at the same time. I mean, how long did it take for these cows to become whales? But again, it's ridiculous. Like Again, foolishness. And this is what people believe. But Galatians 6, 7 says, do not... Sorry, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, he shall also reap. The scientism Big Bang agenda. Scientism has its roots in the Big Bang cosmology and evolutionary thought. If humans have evolved by a material processless process, then there is no basis for believing in a God who created us and revealed moral truths or imposing those moral views in er any area of life. We get into using false science as a weapon. Satan has been able to shoot down the credibility and authority of the Bible. The standard assumption is that science is objective knowledge, while religion is an expression of subjective need. Religion, therefore, must substantiate its claims about the world in whatever science decrees. Now, many people will bring up a lot of scientists, and I know that there's even been Christians like, what about Albert Einstein, and what about these guys? Aren't these guys great? Well, let's see what Albert Einstein had to say about God in the Bible. The word God is, for me, nothing more than the expression and product of human weakness. The Bible is a collection of honorable but still primitive legends, which are nevertheless pretty childish. Right? Let's get to 2 Timothy 4.3.4. 4. And, and as it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Again, we got the fables coming up over and over and over again. Let's get into the biggest lie of all, because again, this is probably why a lot of people are here also getting into, you know, what I've investigated for the last four years, is getting into mainstream science with having a massive deception in place. And if you study, I don't have time in this presentation to go through all the history, but as early as Pythagoras, you see this happening. And all these pivotal points in science's history, you've got links to the occult, the mystery schools, Pythagoras, this has never been, you've always read, you know, science versus religion, science versus religion. And really, truly, what the war was, was scientism. You know, this is the whole thing, is they're trying to pit this truth versus religion. Of course, what would win? Well, science would, and this is what is in everyone's mind. In a way, this is why people got turned off so much by religion, is really the, tr the truth of the fact that these are just man-made fairy tales. And the reality is, is what we're going to see, it's definitely not. But what's striking is if you think that a lot of mainstream science is all atheistic and it's not spiritual, I'm going to show you that you're very wrong in this presentation on how they attack not just the Bible, but also the character and nature of Jesus, and to the point where they even become blasphemous. That if they ever tried this with Buddha or they tried this with Muhammad, like I said, they would be lynched overnight. They'd be terrified to ever say anything against, you know, Muhammad. Yet they will say absolutely despicable and blasphemous things about Jesus. But it's interesting, as Ecclesiastes says, that nothing new happens under the sun. And we think that we're so elevated now with all our technology that this is all new. This is all new. They were primitive back then. Why is it that the mainstream scientists, well-named people, are recognizing that a lot of the stuff that's surfacing now has a lot of links to the Kabbalah and other mystery schools? Let's have Michio Kaku and other ones explain it a little bit better.
I'm a theoretical physicist, and I like to say that I walk in the footsteps of giants like Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. I'm not a philosopher. However, I am rather dazzled by the fact that many of the basic mysteries that we find in string theory and the theory of everything seem to be mirrored, mirrored in the Zohar and in the Kabbalah. As a scholar, the most amazing thing of all is the degree to which modern astrophysics sounds like a Kabbalistic text. When I first made the correlations between Kabbalah and science, I was stunned. We do know that Isaac Newton had access to certain mystical texts, certain texts of the Kabbalah. Well, the Kabbalistic description of creation is coming from a single little point, from a speck, and of having matter form and time and space form all together at the very beginning, this sounds very much to me like the description of the Big Bang. I couldn't believe that the Kabbalists could derive these truths without really knowing any mathematics or physics. All the things that could destroy string theory, all the things that do destroy every rival theory to string theory, they are all eliminated in precisely 10 and 26 dimensions. These dimensions are magic. These dimensions are magic. We physicists don't know where these dimensions come from. The Zohar says those things. It could just have been a lucky guess. I don't know. It's rather amazing. This uncanny reflection of some of the most advanced cosmology that are mirrored in the Zohar and ancient Kabbalistic texts. See, we see this. This is science versus God. And again, there has been in place. Satan's agenda is definitely to annihilate anything to do with the Bible. That's why you see Eastern religions all propped up and everything's wonderful. But again, it's the Bible that must go. The Bible is the most comprehensive book when it comes to cosmology. There's nothing that even comes close to it. I mean, it's well over 250 verses that specifically talk about the nature of the earth. And what's really fascinating is people that don't even think or care about the Bible, with their observations and their testings, it's lining up identical to what the Bible said. Because the Bible has been right all along. It's why it's the most hated. It's why it's been tried to be destroyed. We see this time and time again. And like I said before, as early as Pythagoras, we're going to 570 BC. And when you study all of the mystery schools and all of the different occult notions that were involved in basically him coming up with his ideas that to this day we still use. We use the Pythagorean theorem when we come up with the globe model. This is the eight inches per mile squared, which is the curvature rate. You get one mile, eight inches, two miles, 32 inches, right? And up it goes. But what's really fascinating is when you get to the 56 miles, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. Not much. There's going to be other presentations getting into this a lot more thorough. But I want to explain to the fact that these things were put in place so that people could be verifying and doing these things and not finding it. Even though that these measurements cannot be found, it's so instilled in the culture and in societies that they won't listen to reason. They won't trust their senses, even when it's screaming to them, just like Romans 1 says. The creation is clearly seen. They are without excuse, and yet people would rather believe the fables uh, of men, right? And this is exactly what the Bible says over and over. People will turn. They will turn to false religions. They will turn to... And scientism is literally the biggest religion, and it's the most deadly because it's masqueraded not as a religion. It's masqueraded as the truth, as science. And what we're finding over and over with the most of mainstream science is definitely not science anymore. 56, like I explained, we got major problems, but the Chicago skyline viewed and photographed at 56 miles away from Lake Michigan. This really took effect. It was pretty huge because when this got on the scene, this was early, um, you know, what, what are we seeing here? We're at 56 miles and people came, you know, and said, oh, it's a mirage and all these things. And this was Rob Skiba and Rick Hummer decided, hey, let's go out there on a the boat and let's just see what we can find out. And what's fascinating is they found out quite a bit. And while people will still say, well, wait a minute, I don't know if I can believe in that, things have got even more interesting in 2018 and going into 2019. But let's just carry on this because it's very intriguing uh, from someone that really isn't even believing. But he's like, wait a minute, something's going on. Why are we seeing the distances we are? Did you know that in Lake Michigan, Chicago, Illinois, sits on the western bank of Lake Michigan? I mean, I don't know that. Chicago, Illinois, good sounds town. At one time, Chicago was the second largest town in America, Chicago, Illinois. It sits right there, it butts right up again, Lake Michigan, right up against it, Lake Michigan. You can go 40 miles, 40 miles across the peninsular part of Michigan. I forget the name of the town over there, and it's in another state. And you can get out there on a boat 40-something miles away from Chicago and look across Lake Michigan 
and you can see the skyline of Chicago, Illinois. A meteorologist was talking about what he called a, what is that thing, a mirage? A mirage, a phenomenon of a mirage. That makes sense, doesn't it? That makes sense for the curvature of the earth. How many follow me here now? See, he was trying to explain to people, how can we 40 miles away see and Chicago? what you're seeing here is a mirage. And, and he was explaining to them how that the light was coming up and bouncing back down, and it was a mirage. You weren't really seeing Chicago by looking straight at it. You were seeing a reflection of Chicago through the, through the clouds and the atmosphere and whatever else is up there. So these guys up there, they got in this boat. <laughs> and you've always got somebody like this. <laughs> They hooked up their cameras. They had to wait for a certain day to come clear enough because 40 miles is a long way to see, folks. And they got in their boat and they hooked up their cameras and they focused in on Chicago. You could barely see it, barely, because of the haze and the distance. But they kept their cameras trained on Chicago, Illinois, and they began to cross Lake Michigan. And do you know something? Nothing ever changed except Chicago got clearer. Now, if you're following me in all of this, here's the point. If the Earth is curved, they should not have been able to see Chicago 40 miles away. Is that right? I'm not saying I believe it, but it makes me think. How did they see Chicago? That was actually from my documentary, Impossible. Anyone's uh, seen that one? Yeah? It's uh, pretty incredible because I think it sits at about 1.2 million views. It's been viewed a tremendous amount of times. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's a collaboration of a lot of great people uh, in there. Like I do, I like to feature uh, solid work when I uh, do my films. Uh, putting that one together, it's, uh, it was quite profound in everything that it touched on. And I'll have a couple more clips as we go on. But what's amazing is a lot of people discounted that and said it's refraction or, you know, it's a, a mirage, which was silly. The fact is, regardless where you stand on that, late 2018 into 2019, infrared has come out. And with infrared, we can see in hundreds, 150. You know, well, how are we seeing 150 miles away, right, with infrared? And infrared is exploding, and they're going to have a very hard time explaining it. The reality is the reason why, because the Bible says, right? This is exactly what the Bible states. And this is exactly what people that are doing observations and testing are finding in the enclosed model that it is flat. Of course, it has mountains and valleys and all these sort of things. But the reality is that we're not on a ball in what they've been telling us, a spinning ball at that. And we're going to see many reasons that the Bible completely looks at the foolishness of even believing it. I mean, I can imagine that up in heaven, they're like, really? They actually believe that they're flying and zigzagging? I mean, think about the model sitting there, and they actually believe it's like doing this, and it's twirling. And it, I mean, it must be almost laughable. It's actually sad that they would go that far and, and be that ridiculous. And for me, I've always looked in the Bible. If there was one verse, even poetically, that said the earth flies through the heavens like an eagle, I wouldn't even be up here today. It'd be over. Because poetry even conveys a truth. And while you can look at Psalms and look at other areas that definitely aren't, you know, historical, they're more poetry. And this is the argumentation of saying everything in the Bible is poetry or allegory. No, it's not. Because most people will sit there and say, Joshua, that definitely was historic. Right? But yeah, we got a big problem. Right? What happened? Right? We got the, the, uh, the sun and the moon stopping. Right? But we'll get into that a little bit here. Getting into verses, the Bible over and over states the fact that the earth does not move. And it doesn't just say it once, it says it over and over. I think it's 11 times in total. Um, maybe we should get the hint, especially if you believe in the Bible. It's like, it, he didn't just say it once where it's like, well, I don't know if we could take it over and over. It's on pillars, it rests, it's immovable, it's fixed. It's like, how many times does God have to convey to his people, this is exactly the reality, but yet you, oh, I don't know, Bill Nye, he's pretty amazing. I, you know, I like to see him jog. You know, I really like him, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's amazing, you know. I mean, people would rather listen to actors. They're not even a scientist. I mean, Bill Nye's not even a scientist, and yet he's on all the talk shows. How have we fallen? I mean, how have we, like, it's almost embarrassing to the level that we are sinking. But the Bible over and over explains it. 
And what's so profound about this investigation is so many people are opening the Bible for the first time. And regardless, whether it's ancient cosmologies and looking at it, they knew. But the argumentation is that evolution, we're so much smarter, they're primitive and idiots, cavemen, right? We were heard. The fact is, in ways, in my opinion, we're just catching up to the technologies that existed in the past. There's some fascinating studies when you get into what was going on back in the day and how there's been many lies to cover up the truth. And we can get into many areas where the Bible, even when it comes into giants, how the Bible explains that, whether it's uh, David and Goliath or other ones. The fact is, there's a lot of cover-ups going on. Dinosaurs is another one. Huge cover-ups. They got major problems problems with the narrative that what the Bible states so they could try over and over to hide the truth. This was the one that really impacted me, Genesis 1, 6 to 10, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Right? This is the one that got me because, again, it explains so very clear that there was water and that the firmament divided it. Dome, whatever you want to say. I want to go through this briefly because a lot of people would say, well, wait a minute, when the flood happened, it was like a canopy over the, the globe earth and water fell down and that was it. But the Bible explains like 100 BC, right? That's 1,500 years after the flood. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters be above the heavens. Water still exists up there. Could it be as simple as why is the sky blue? Yes. Right? Could it be that simple? And, and the reality is we look at it sometimes and we think, well, wait a minute, but we're so, we know the molecules and this and that. But you've got to remember that when God established the world and when he wrote a book that would be basic instructions before leaving earth, here you go. Everyone would understand it. They would look up and they would understand it. Water, blue, blue, water. And I'm saying to erode that over time, you've got to go to some pretty major methods. And scientism don't even have the full answers. Even rainbows are a problem for them, right? Rainbow conveys the truth of what we're in, you know? I'm saying it's very, very clear God has established it all throughout the time. You can bring up other religious texts, but there's no other book that explains so much exactly the reality we live and the importance of getting to know him. Because it's not so much important to learn about the creation. Seek the creator. Because I'll tell you, if this was created, wow, I want to get to know that creator. It's worthy, it's in a worthy, worthy pursuit. Job 37, 18. Has thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as molten looking glass? Well, wait, we've got a problem here. Because what about all those rocket ships and all this kind of thing? I mean, how can we be in a dome? I mean, we're seeing all these things happen, right? This is Job 37, 18. This is the oldest book in the Bible. But we get into Amos 9, 6. And why I bring up Amos 9, 6 is because it was really profound for my story. And I won't go into the entire testimony. If you haven't heard the story on how me and my family got kicked out of two churches, check out the Flat Earth International Conference Canada where I explain the whole story. And I actually mention the churches that are in the city that I'm actually there because I did the first international Flat Earth Conference in Canada in my home city. But what was intriguing about Amos 9, 6 is the church, the, sec the first church that we were going to, the translation they used was the NASB. And this is the KJV. It says, It is he that buildeth his stories in the heavens, and hath founded his troop in the earth. He has called for the waters of the sea, and poured them upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. But what's intriguing with the NASB, which is the church I was at, and I remember going up to my pastor at the time, and I said, Hey, can I grab your Bible? He's like holding it, right? I'm like, Can you, can you explain this one for me? So I would sit there and just go to his Bible. I would open it up, and I'd be like, can I get the explanation? I'm still waiting for the explanation. I asked nine times, and you know, I'm gonna probably just put a little thing in my phone every year, remind me, to be like, do you still, you got it yet? Do you got it yet? Because the one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his troop was KJV. But what does it say here? Vaulted dome. It is the most direct translation when it comes to explaining it. There's other translations that say dome. This one says vaulted dome. Have you ever seen a vault? A vaulted dome. I mean, this is like boom, right on the earth, right? So some people will sit there and say, well, I don't know how do we prove and how do we know that there's a dome or a firmament? No, it's not just the Bible. They're finding a lot of things in scientific research all over that is supporting the fact that we indeed are living under the dome. 
right? But we get into the globe earth and we get into the, you know, flat enclosed earth and we see all the implications on that, right? Matches the Bible. This is just basically twisting. It's easier to understand evolution with the globe. It's easier to understand the alien deception with the globe. Over and over, climate change makes more sense on the globe. All these sort of things. In my opinion, there's a lot of things that have been put in place, not just that. And I look at the fact that this deception is not like a means to an end. It's the fact that there is an end point coming and they're preparing us for something. This is all programming, not just for the deception itself, but to prepare us for what's to come. Genesis 1, 16 to 17, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God sent them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. Remember the stars, because it's really important. Because again, in the Bible, there's all sorts of different discussions on the stars. And we're going to see a very strong occultic connection and how deep this whole star thing goes. But let's just go really quickly for time, because I might run out here. Um, let's just get into the stars. The Bible pretty much says that they're all going to fall to earth. Well, well, wait a minute. We've got a big problem. You know, Beetlejuice is heading our way. You know, there's a big issue if all the stars are going to fall to earth. But this is what the Bible says. Could they be closer and smaller than what we're taught? The Bible clearly says over and over. The Bible clearly does not mention planets. The only time it's ever mentioned is Mazala, which is, means the constellation of the stars, the zodiac. There is no such thing as planets. Everything that we see in the sky are lights. Yes, there's different color lights. There's lights that do different things. They move different ways. But the reality is they have basically brainwashed the world, telling that they're terra firma. We can land on these things. We can play golf. We got little rovers. You know, this is ridiculous. Over and over, we see this over and over again. The star connection. What's really interesting about this is this is my very first video I put on when I created Celebrate Truth. You go back in my list on Celebrate Truth on YouTube. This is the very first video. And it, of all things, it wasn't even Flat Earth. It was stars. And I started with the star connection before I even got in to bringing Flat Earth out. But let's go into this a little bit. Where, where are we from? I mean, we've been told that, you know, it's from the goo to the zoo to you. But you ask yourself, where's the goo? And what they'll say is, well, we're from stars. We're stardust. And you don't have to take my word for it. Let's listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson tell you that this is what you are. You're nothing more than stardust. I am, we are stardust. Yes. What does that mean? For me, the most astonishing fact is that the molecules that comprise our body are traceable, are traceable to the crucibles of the centers of stars that manufactured these elements from lighter versions of themselves and then exploded, scattering this enrichment across the galaxy into gas clouds that would later collapse to form next generation star systems. One of those star systems was ours. These atoms and molecules are in us because in fact the universe is in us. And we are not only figuratively, but literally stardust. I mean, this is nothing more than, you know, pantheism. You get polytheism with believes in, you know, trillions of gods. But pantheism is that we are all God. Everything, nature, everything, we're all God. But you see how science is validating it. Why are they validating a religion, a pantheism? And yet this is the same story. It's deeper. This has always been spiritual. This, there's no doubt about it. Anybody that looks at it very clearly, you'll see. And getting into the stars, it gets into attacking the validity of the Bible and the character of Jesus. And this is exactly it, because Satan hates the truth. He hates the cross of Christ, and he hates what it stands for. And you can see it with the scientists over and over. The, um, this is something that, that, that I wrote a whole book about, and someone asked me yesterday why I wrote that book. Because it is the most poetic thing I know about the universe. Um, but the amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. Okay? <laughs> And, and anyway, this is great. the reality is that Jesus actually, you know, hearing, hearing that would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the compassion and love that Jesus has. You know, where we can sit there and get angry at it. The fact is, you say, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're saying. I mean, it's amazing to see, don't, you know, forget Jesus, right? How little they understand truly how important it was, you know? 
And like I said, for years I looked at it and I didn't understand it and I thought it was laughable. But when you really realize how much God truly loves us and the fact that he made a way, it's not like we can work our way to heaven, that he actually made the way for us to get to him is an amazing story. It's hard for people to understand, but it's incredible. When we're getting into scientism, you know, this gets very, very deep because the scientists, the so-called atheists, again, Satan is using them like pawns. He's using them for the spiritual deception that will take someone's soul. This is very serious. People, it's not just they're learning this. They are going to lose their soul. You know, it's one thing to come to the truth. If, as a truther, if you believe in certain truths, but if you don't understand the one who is the truth, who claimed to be the truth, and that's his words. You don't get mad at me. It's what he said. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So who is he? Is he a lunatic? Is he a liar? Or is he truly the Son of God? Is he Lord? Is he God? This is what is important. And everyone should at least take the opportunity to evaluate his life critically. Don't just take, ah, oh, I got a couple hours and, you know, whatever. Look at it. Because it, the implications are huge. If he truly is who he said he is, it will change your life. It's your salvation. It's important, right? If you think he's a liar, fine. I have not had one person that really took the time and studied it and came back and said, I think he's a bloody liar. What's really intriguing is most people actually like Jesus. They'll look at it and they'll be like, he lived a good life. Then why are people dragging him through the mud? Why are they attacking him? These are the things that are really important when it comes to this deception and many other ones. But let's get into this really quickly because Isaiah 14, 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Who is that? Satan. This is Satan. This has been his aspiration from day one. And this is why he fuels mankind to do this, to do what you can't do. It's not possible. But he wants people to fall in the same way that he's fallen, in rebellion against God, going against the very nature of a loving God that basically has put a plan in place so incredibly easy. How do you, how do you accept my son? Do you spit at my son? Do you ignore my son? Right? Or will you love and embrace my son? investigate him. That is exactly why the importance of this is important because when you come to these verses, you will see that this is what he's fueling mankind, not just to go against the Bible and the truth of Jesus, but also when it comes to this topic of importance. Psalms 115, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given it to the children of men. What that says is the dominion that God laid out for us is the earth. We're not given dominion up. And notice the aspirations, just like in the verse that I read before, was, I will ascend, I'm going up. Regardless what Psalm says, it says you haven't been given dominion there. The fact is they can't, they're trying, they're bonk, bonk, they're hitting the dome, they're doing all sorts of things, they're going, freezing out in Antarctica. They're trying to keep it from the world. But the reality is, it says it does not exist, and it does not give you the right to go there. So this whole idea that we're going to inhabit Mars, you know, that we're going to colonize Mars, and we're driving rovers around, this is all nonsense. This is all nonsense. We know this even from without the Bible, how much crazy nonsense this is, but yet the Bible says, look right here. I haven't given it to the children of men. You won't go there. So if you really want to believe that NASA is so powerful, they could override the sovereignty of God and be like, we're going there anyways. I haven't given it to you, right? And the very fact that, I'll tell you one thing, if he confused all the languages and took down the Tower of Babel, he definitely is going to be uh, dealing with NASA. But the fact is, he gives the, the right and that ability to understand who do you choose? Are you going to choose men or are you going to choose me? It all comes down to that, right? You know, people will say all the time, well, books, you know, they're written by men. No, the Bible is unique in the sense that basically God wrote the Bible through men. It's like me writing a letter to my wife. I wouldn't say, yeah, uh, sweetie, uh, the pen wrote you a letter. I wrote the letter, but through the pen, God used humans to write his word. And again, that is the importance of this discussion when it comes to the Bible. Look into it. Take the time. That's what I did. I laughed at it. I thought it was ridiculous, but I took the time and I looked into it. And I'll tell you, it, it definitely changed my life. Let's get into the greatest achievement is the fraud, because I'll tell you, this is uh, something that is one of the biggest gateways into the discussion that we're talking about, how most people believe this, but the question is, is it true? Sixty years ago, when the Russians beat us into space, we didn't deny Sputnik was up there. <laughs> we didn't argue about the science or shrink our research and development budget. We built a space program almost overnight, and 12 years later, we were walking on the moon.
Roger, 11. We've been, uh, I've just been vectored to another monitor, and uh, sure enough, the browns are coming in a lot more distinctly on the uh, item 4 that we have up on our uh, screen in the control center over. Okay, uh, world, hold on to your hat. I'm going to turn you upside down. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. sound stage in New Mexico. That's not... That never happened. Let each man say what he deems truth, and let truth itself be commended unto God. So it comes down to uh, you know, the moon landing, and uh, they're getting a little desperate now with all of this exposing that's going on. This is Hollywood 49 years later, and what a weird anniversary of the so-called moon landing to come out you know, with First Man. Um, I thought about it and I was just like, wouldn't you release it on the 50th anniversary? Like, wouldn't that make sense? Could you not wait just like a couple more months and release it on the 50th year? Like, who does? Like, uh, honey, let's celebrate our, our 49th anniversary bigger than our 50th. It makes no sense. But again, they're getting desperate. Many people are starting to question the moon. They're in damage control. And this is exactly what's going on. But it's very clear to see. It's Got some behind the scenes footage from First Man. But, could it be? How would you know? I mean, movies like Gravity and you're getting into First Man, it just shows you how easy it is. I mean, how do you know? And the reality is that these are not real video. This is not real image. When you come into the moon, and the moon is so critical, because I believe that when you attach the Bible to a lie, you basically get people to the point where, well, now we're going to merge the two. And this is why the discussion for a lot of people that believed in the Bible was over. is because, isn't it intriguing, and I probably won't have a ton of time to go through a lot of the occult natures and the dark beginnings of NASA, but I'll try a little bit here. Um, but why are people that are involved in Satanism, sex magic, rituals, occult, all that, why are they reading scripture doing this deception? And again, this is really important. Now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth, and the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. 
that uh, let there be a ferment in the midst of the water. So do you see what's happening there? Again, it's not just the fact that they went to the moon to get that picture of that blue marble. They had to solidify the fact that the Bible, when you read the verses like Isaiah 40, 22, God says above the circle of the earth, boom. That was completely placed in the people's minds. And from that point on, it was established. God created the world. And they saw that over and over. I mean, how many people, they, most people actually heard it on the radio. They didn't even see it. But again, it's a very subtle way of securing the lie and attaching it to the Bible. But we can clearly see with all of their missions, all of their explorations, we'll get into you know, some of the beginnings of NASA really quickly here. But again, you got Mercury, Gemini. I mean, these, are, these are Roman gods. This has nothing to do with Christianity whatsoever. You get into the, and I know that Jared Cressman next will be getting deeper into the Nazi uh, connection. And I'm telling you, you're in for a, a treat because it is a dark, deep ride when it comes to how crazy their cosmology was. But guess what? You got Operation Paperclip, where the U.S. are like, come on, you know, come on. And these guys are wicked guys. I and mean, I could go into this over and over. But why are, you know, these guys being recruited into the U.S.? You know, and these are the beginnings of NASA. Werner von Braun, you know, you get some really, you know, sinister guys. Like here, you have uh, Alex Dr. Crowley, Jack Parsons, Ron, uh, Ron L. Hubbard, you know, Werner von Braun, Walt Disney. Look into the connections with that. It's pretty startling. What is going on when these guys are all together? A little bit about Jack Parsons. He's considered the father of modern rocketry. This guy was like seriously evil to the core, man. He was admitted to like praying and like doing sex magic. And I believe he was like into Pan and all these sort of things. Well, you know, who was the god Pan? You get into it and like, Pan is like a demonic pagan god of sexual perversion and pedophilia. But what's, true, what's really amazing is the origins when they talk about the continents and Pangaea. And I found it very, very interesting that really when it comes down to the beginnings, because they say millions of years ago, this is what the earth looked like. Pan equals demonic god. Geo is earth. Could it be the earth of the demon? Or Satan's depiction? Or how he wanted to portray his world to humanity? And this is exactly, it goes so much deeper than just, oh, you believe in the ball in space. Even into the origins of the words, it goes deep, guys. Really look into it. Don't have time for this one. It just shows the connection with... Um, Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley was so wicked, he was kicked out of Britain. He admitted to human sacrifices, all sorts of stuff. Um, really bad actor. But again, these guys are connected with the origins of NASA. What is going on? We have problems over and over and over. Obelisks with, uh, you know, you've got Rome, you've got London, you've got, uh, you know, uh, DC. And again, you see the rockets as a symbol. It goes deep exactly what is truly going on. We have Elon Musk with this stupid car that everyone believed in was space. But what's really intriguing is this guy is so evil, he actually took his kids out of school. And what did he do? He created his own school, own education for his children. His school is called Ad Astra, Towards the Stars. Again, we get stars. Stars are very deep. And in that video that I skipped, Aleister Crowley was talking about every man and every woman is a star. And he talked about coming together in the spirituality, the oneness, the global new world order. The stars are a big deal. And there's a lot of deceptions in place. But it's so secretive that nobody even knows what's being taught there. Like even the media, nobody is allowed to, under, to see what the children of Elon Musk are being taught. Again, we have connections over and over and over again when it comes to all of these things. I'm going to skip through because I'm just going to wrap up. Get, let's get to Werner von Braun. What's fascinating about him is the fact that, you know, could this be a deathbed confession? On his tombstone, he leaves Psalms 19.1, right? He died in 1977, and he's, you know, part of this deceptions, and it's almost like he wanted to send a message to the world. I honestly believe it, because what does Psalms 19.1 say? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Again, we see this all the time. Guys, we have not I'd gone to go to the to moon, the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology, and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. But going to Mars should be uh, one of the next series of steps that humans do. The first step should be going back to the moon for a number of technical uh, reasons and exploration reasons, and then after that, Mars, maybe a uh, high orbit in uh, Venus atmosphere, maybe going to Europa, there's all... Just blah, 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 right? Oh yeah, our technology, we, we, can't, we can't do that, but let's go to Mars, you know? You know? 
Wait a minute, isn't, isn't Mars a little bit further than the moon? It's ridiculous, right? I don't have a lot of time left, but I'm just saying that it, this is everywhere. And you're going to not just see the deceptions, you're going to see the occult origins. You're going to see that this is very spiritual, and Satan is behind it. Because you get into Enhancing Humanity Rising, the Prometheus Project, when you get into it, you see the connections. This was the God that created man out of clay and gave them this liberty. And what does science do, right? The gift of science to liberty, Prometheus. Again, they are bringing up the pagan gods. This is being revived for a very specific reason. There's, there you go, a nice little statue that they got there that science gave. Again, this is deep. When you get into CERN, what the heck is Shiva outside of CERN headquarters? I mean, they're just do, doing science, doing a big bang. I mean, this is the this is the, what the god of destruction. I mean, these are not this like little fairy, you know, pixie uh, gods. I mean, these are very vicious, vicious gods. You know, when you get into it, you get into CERN, right? You get into all these things. It's crazy, but when it comes down to it, understand that I said that there is something that's coming, and they're preparing it or the way for it. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Right? We got Mitchu Akaku, you know, talking about stuff as well. If there can't be an upside to all this. I'm a big fan of the original Star Trek series, and it was only when, uh, you know, there were alien civilizations that seemed to uh, challenge the Earth that you found that the Earth got its act together for the kind of global governance that all the, uh, you know, all the visionaries say we need that if we're going to deal with climate change, if we're going to deal with all the, uh, all the modern issues, global finance, where the, our, our, the sovereignty of individual nations is actually a political barrier to solving these big problems. So can there be an upside to the alien threat? Believe it or not, when President Ronald Reagan met Mikhail Gorbachev, we now know during the transcripts of the meeting that he said that if we were ever attacked by the Martians, you and me, the Soviets and the capitalist U.S., would be allies in the fight against the Martians. Well, that's how Ronald Reagan looked at it, and believe it or not, there's some truth to it. If we are faced with a common enemy in outer space, it would indeed help to unite the Earth just the way Ronald Reagan said. One world order. Again, this one put in place for a very specific reason. Here we've got, you know, Bill Nye. And again, this is what is being passed as educating our children, and yet no one bats an eye. It's extraordinary, but not crazy to suggest that Mars was hit with an impactor through what's generally called a Hohmann orbit, an orbit where it goes falls toward the sun but ends up on the Earth. You and I are descendants of Martians. Okay, that and that's not, not crazy. And that's not crazy. Is it crazy that you and I are descendants of Adam and Eve? Uh, we are descendants from a common ancestor. I don't but know is that it crazy that is it crazy that God made the first man and woman and we're descendants there's, of them? For me, there's no evidence of that. So is that crazy? But I, I wouldn't use that word. It's, what would you say? It's a uh, you're betraying your intellect. Again, yeah, just continue on. You got NASA even admitting to the fact that there's you know programming and things in place yeah. getting ready. Quite a few of us are. It's been well covered up by all of our governments uh, for the last 60 years or so, uh, but slowly it's leaked out, and some of us have privileged to have been briefed on some of it, but I've also been in military circles and intelligence circles that know beneath the surface of what has been uh, public knowledge that, yes, we have a he believes that, like I do, that there is a cover-up. We just have a d discrepancy in our world's view as to what we're really, what the, what's behind the phenomena. Again, he's extraterrestrial, I'm interdimensional, and specifically uh, the fallen ones, fallen angels, which you read about back in Genesis 6, once again manifesting on the earth. So there is evidence, there's plenty of evidence. Um, uh, we've got the witnesses. Now listen very closely in closing when it comes to exactly what they have been preaching all along and exactly what they're wanting for humanity. And when I say what they want, what Satan wants. He wants you to tap in to this power. He wants you to become one with the universe and with the stars. And as you look and research into this, you will see the importance of the star connection, but also exactly where is this heading? We are at a, at a time in history where we can change the world. 
What do we want to pass on to future generations? That we just stayed here on earth, that we didn't look out to find out where we come from and are we alone? No, we want to pass on this joy, this excitement. When a nation dreams big, everything falls into place. Beyond the horizon, beyond the horizon over the next hill, over the next hill. That's, where we make discoveries. that's where we make discoveries. That's the next frontier. It is in us to work farther and deeper. It's deep within us. That is why we are all here. Over the next hill, beyond the horizon. Dream of tomorrow, tomorrow. Long for the open seas. All for this adventure. Dream big. Dream big, dream of tomorrow, tomorrow, all oh, 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 for the open seas, for the open seas. There are lots of huge frozen worlds caught beyond Neptune, Neptune, huge frozen worlds. Seek out these other worlds. Hundreds of other worlds caught beyond Neptune, Neptune, caught beyond Neptune, Neptune. Seek out these other worlds. Audacious visions have the power to alter mind states, to change assumptions about what is possible. Beyond the horizon, beyond the horizon over, the next hill, over the next hill, that's where we make discoveries, that's the next frontier. It is in us to work farther and deeper, it's deep within us, that is why we are all here, over the next hill, beyond the horizon. If we are to discover life on another world, it will change the way everyone feels about what it is to be a living thing in the cosmos. Is the virus alive? Is the crystal alive? Does life need this? Does life need li liquid water? Is the virus alive? Does life have metabolism? Does life need life need life need life need this? Is the virus alive? Is the crystal alive? They're ask 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 asking these questions. Working together, I claim we can change the world. Change the world. There's a just tremendously exciting prospect called solar sailing, and it works exactly as uh, an ordinary sailboat does. It takes you to where you want to go. It's a whole new kind of idea. It travels on the wind from the sun. From the sun. It takes you to where you want to go. It's a whole new kind of idea. It travels on the wind from the sun. From the sun. These dreams prevail in the citizens' ambitions. It is time to set sail for the 21st century. Beyond the horizon, beyond the horizon over the next hill, that's where we make discoveries. That's the next frontier. It is in us to look farther and deeper. It's deep within us. That is why we are all here. Over the next hill, beyond the horizon. Beyond the horizon, that's the next frontier. It is in us to work farther and deeper. It's deep within us. That is why we are all here. Over the next hill, beyond the horizon. Find your place in space. Space is vast and unexplored. There's a lot of work to do. Deceived by scientism. Have uh, God's word be the final authority on all matters. Thank you very much.